Okay, we are live. Hello to everyone out there. Hello to everyone who's watching live and hello to everyone who is watching in the future. My name is Jeremy Savo. This is the Making It in Music show, episode three. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping for me is that I'm releasing my first solo EP very soon. It's called Homemade Love Songs. I recorded it at my home in Clementon, New Jersey. Um, currently, I'm in Hawaii, but I recorded it back where I used to live in Clementon, New Jersey. I'm releasing the first single called Break My Mind on Monday, January 22nd. That's coming up soon. Best way to find updates about that is to follow me on YouTube, follow me on Instagram. And um, yeah, there will be plenty of updates about that. Um, and now on to today's guest. My guest today is John Smythe. Um, he is a producer, a guitarist, a YouTuber, uh, a husband and a father. He's based in New Jersey, if I'm correct. And uh, I met him in an interesting way, which he'll probably tell you about soon. Um, and I think I've just been sort of loosely aware of him and following along on social media as he's grown up. And as I've grown up, I think we've just been kind of loosely aware of what each other are up to. I'm not entirely certain if we have actually spoken other than like comments on Facebook and Instagram since we met, uh, cor but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but he did in, uh, in, in a small part, uh, inspire me to start this live streaming series by some of the comments he left me and, uh, by some of the inspiration I picked up from watching some of his YouTube videos. So, um, yeah, I will have info on how to follow him on YouTube in the description. Um, it's Smythe Plays. And uh, yeah, so thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you. It's amazing. Like you said, uh, you know, I've been following you as well. Um, and, I, you know, I think one of the things that stuck out to me when we met was the fact that you were telling me about Beard Fest. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that you could. Obviously, people throw festivals, but I didn't know that you could throw a festival, you know? Yeah. And um, I remember hearing about Beard Fest and since then it's just blown up and blown up and blown up to where I saw, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, I saw Corey Henry performed at, at Beard Fest. Was that 2021? That was actually like 2015 or 2016. Really? Yeah. It wasn't that was, that was the last time he performed at Beard Fest? 2017? It was that was a while back, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, but I, I remember seeing, I'm like, okay, wow. Corey Henry and the and the Funk Apostles at Beard Fest. Like, all right. Now now meeting you, and I'll say where we met at yes. at my my I think that was the first job I ever had. I was a a clerk, a a clerk, or I guess a merchant or whatever you would call it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> at Camden County College Bookstore in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And, um, you know, that was basically from like 2011 to 2016. And uh, oh, wow. You worked there for a while, huh? For a long time. Uh, I stopped taking classes and I was still working at the bookstore. Oh, uh, um, but yeah, it, it was crazy to see how, you know, the 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 music circles I was a part of and following, I started seeing basically our worlds collide. I'm like, yeah. I'm pretty sure I I met this guy at the bookstore. Weird <laughs> 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 fest is like huge, you know. Yeah, you know. So I you you messaged me earlier, being like, "Yo, do you remember how we met?" I'm gonna talk about that, and and I I totally remember that. I've I've always remembered that. Um, but you know what I forgot is that I forgot you were behind the desk. I thought we were both just kind of in there as students. Um, yeah. but somehow I guess we struck up a conversation and realized that we're both musicians. Yeah, I re I remember we had a. It's funny I remember this conversation so well. But you're you're right in that I don't think we've spoken since. Right. Other other than like commenting on each other's stuff from time to time. Right, exactly. And I remember yeah. we were talking because you were playing at I think it was an AME church. Either it was an AME church I was or playing at a, uh, it was called Agape. I used to play at a church called Agape. Okay. It was around then and I'm like, oh wow, like 
I didn't know, I didn't know that there were church, not that you're a church musician, but musicians that play in church at Camden County, because everyone that I had met at Camden County kind of came from a, kind of came from the background of, you know how it is in South Jersey. Like there's, there's kind of two scenes in South Jersey, Philly. There's kind of like the rock band scene. And then there's mm. sort of like the church. Mm. I call it like, it's almost like the warm daddies scene. You know what I mean? The, the what? Warm daddies. You know, warm daddies is a, it was a restaurant. No, I, I don't know anything about that. You don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, warm daddies is cool. Uh, but it's made that before. Yeah. Warm daddies. It was on, uh, it was on Columbus and Columbus and I can't remember where, but like basically, you know where the Dave and Buster's is on Columbus. Uh, yeah, roughly. Yeah. So if you, if you go maybe, I would say like maybe half a mile South warm daddies is near the, uh, the movie theater. I think it's in the yeah. same, like, you know, development as the movie theater. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, AMC theater. But anyway, Not like, like a, you know, an important part of the scene there. Kind of. Yeah. Like you, you know, it's, it's like one of those places where if you gig around Philly, you probably, you would end up if you're in certain scenes, cause it was like a gospel R and B, you know? Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that there were musicians at Camden County who played in churches as well, because most of the people I was encountering were doing the, you know, I'm, I was in a band, like I enjoy music. I was in a band, you know, with, uh, you know, with my friends and like, you know, we played the truck and stuff like that. But then like the, the way that I came up when I started playing music was like, it was more so playing in church, which yeah. is just, they're, they're two different worlds, you know? Yeah. I, I think, I actually think about this a lot. Uh, cause I came up in the school of rock. Um, are you familiar with that? The school yes. of rock? Yeah. So uh, I came up mostly. Yeah. Yeah, I came up in the School of Rock, which for anyone listening who doesn't know, it's uh it's an after school program. So it's it's the kind of thing where you just, you know, you sign up and you pay whatever and you go you go and you get a lesson every week. And then you the, the thing that's really cool about it is you also go to a rehearsal every week for a different rock show. So it's like, you know, you're 13 years old and you're going to be in the Led Zeppelin show in the spring season. And so the whole spring you're going to rehearsals every week rehearsing with other kids and then at the end of the season you go to a venue and you put on a show and and we would always do two nights and you would sell tickets and it was a whole thing um we would do like elaborate lighting and sound and it was it was a big scene like all the kids would come out and support each other and you get your friends to come out and and that's sort of how i came up playing with other musicians and and i feel like all the best musicians i know either came up in school of rock or they came up in church. Um, I, I actually, in a weird way, see them as parallel worlds um, because th there's all sorts of different ways of, you know, of doing music education, but the school of rock and the, and the church, I guess specifically like black churches, um, they, they have this culture of like, you're playing together, you're jamming together with lots of different musicians on a regular basis. And it's very ear based. It's not about reading something off a of paper. It's about hearing what's going on and being able to hang with it and performing in front of people and all that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. It's there's there's a uh, there's a sense of all right, what I'm what I'm doing, what I'm performing. This is bigger than just me. This is bigger than me or my nerves or making sure I nailed that part. Like, no, there's a, there's an entire show that has to happen and I'm a part of it. It's not about me. I'm just, I'm a part of it and I have to do what I do. You know, yeah. I, I think the, the only difference is, you know, church is church. Isn't there for music, right? You're, you're in a church service, obviously, um, you know, to, to aid in, in worship. So it's, it's a little, it's slightly different, but you're right. It's very, very parallel, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's certainly different in that regard. But um, I guess just, just in the sense of like, it's a breeding ground for great players. Exactly. Is what I mean. um, and, I, and I think what you're saying, it's bigger than about you. Um, obviously at church, that's the ultimate example of it's not, a, it's not just about you. 
Right. Um, and I actually think that's something really fantastic about church um, and playing music at church. And I actually did review a bunch of your videos this morning um, in preparation for talking to you. And I encountered one thing you said about ways to make money as a musician. You mentioned church gigs and how that was that's been a part of your life. And you mentioned something about like feeling some kind of way about going to church to collect a paycheck. And you also brought up the topic of like, should someone who's not Christian play a church gig? Mm -hmm. um, it's an, and you said, you said, I personally wouldn't recommend it, but it depends. Yeah. Um, I'm not Christian myself. And I did church gigs for seven years and I loved it so much. Um, I would completely understand why certain churches wouldn't want that. But I'm super, super grateful for for people accepting me um, and letting me be a part of their thing, you know, because I'm an outsider. Um, but I think that the thing that it is, what's going on there is so amazing. Yeah, I, I think it's it's all about respect on both sides, because yeah. if if two parties agree you know, if, if the church is saying, all right, we understand that these are not your beliefs and like, you know, the person coming in understands, okay, these are, these aren't my beliefs. And, you know, there's, there still has to be respect. Um, not even just, I believe not even just while you're in the church, but just in general, like, you know, how you carry yourself and, and the things that you say, uh, it's, it's case by case, you know? Yeah. Um, I know for me personally, I am a Christian and that's the reason why I, I had a conviction about it because it there's, I mean, we, we could get into it, but the whole playing in church thing is it's, it's been a, uh, it's been a journey. That's, mm. that's the least I could say, but where I came to in 2019 was the fact that this is what I believe would I still be here in church? And when I say what I believe, meaning like, you know, I, I believe in the gospel and all that. I'm like, you know, I'm a, I'm a devout Christian. Would I still be here if I wasn't collecting a check? And I really had to take time in 2019 and ask myself that question and, and step away from playing. And since then, um, I have, I've been back playing. Um, when my second daughter was born, I kind of stepped away again, just obviously, you know, responsibilities and priorities but yeah since 2019 i kind of stepped back and made sure all right i'm going to be playing music anyway i love to play music but let me make sure that this is not i'm not taking music and i'm uh how would you say conflating my beliefs with my love for music because it can it can get messy that way and then yeah. there's expectations and you know whole whole nine yeah 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 totally totally feel you on that and I, I i know some of the other some musicians that i've played with in the past at church have had similar dilemmas um for me uh, i've always been up front whenever i've had a church gig i'm like hey do you mind hiring someone who doesn't believe because i don't but i would love to play for you guys um and then, you know, as long as that's cool, you know, the, the church I was playing at before I moved to Hawaii for the last two years was just an incredible place to be. Um, despite the fact that I don't share all of their beliefs, I love the pastor and his sermons were awesome. And I, I got something out of them like every week. Um, but not only that, I, I thought the community was so beautiful and I, and I talk about this a lot. Uh, I think music is one of its main functions in society is to help build community. Um, and I think it does that really in amazing ways in the context of church. So, yeah. So so I, I love that. But um, maybe to move on from church, um, that maybe that that does that lead into how you got started in music? Is, th is that where you got started in music? Uh sort of so when i started playing in church was when i really i would say became serious about it but where i started in music so i i come from generally a musical family i guess you would say my parents don't play um they love music 
you know, they had me listening to like John Coltrane and Miles Davis and, you know, a bunch of a bunch of great jazz when I was younger. But the musicians in my family are my oldest brother and uh, my the second oldest brother. They're both older than me. I'm the youngest. So um, the oldest one, Len, is a is a DJ. He was a DJ for a group called Company Flow, who, um, you know, Company Flow is if you're if you're like into underground hip hop, especially in the late 90s, Company Flow is pretty much like a legendary group. Um, it was him, LP from uh, Run the Jewels and Big Just. They were a group back in that time. So and then my my uh, other brother, Matt, he played the trumpet and keyboard and uh, he, he plays everything. And um, my earliest memories of music was hearing my brother in the basement practicing like scratching routines and hearing my brother uh, just playing jazz in, in the room with the door closed. So I always feel like that that puts something in me to know, all right, if I'm if I'm doing music, it involves practicing and like that that kind of time where you're just in your room practicing and and um like a sort of solitude kind of thing. Yeah. And um so that stuck with me. I, I fooled around on the keyboard a little bit when I was young. Uh, but I would say it really started in f- fifth or sixth grade when I, I started producing, really making sample based uh, productions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said, um, unfortunately, I was stealing drum packs, like finding them on Google. You know, yeah, I feel like most producers do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were a kid and you needed you needed resources to work with. We all did it. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, (laughs) so, uh, yeah, I was, I was doing that. And then I would, I would, uh, search for like, you know, Freddie Hubbard, like red clay, stuff like that. Or, uh, what was another one of my favorites to sample? I love the stylistics. I still love the stylistics. Um, but because of the hip hop background that I had, I knew that the place to go for good samples was like seventies jazz, seventies soul, um, which informs the later part of the journey, but, um, but yeah, so that was, that was really the beginning. And then in ninth grade, I started playing guitar, which is a, oh, a very cool amazing. story because my sister and I bought guitar hero <laughs> and we played it the summer. I think it was eighth grade going into ninth grade. So my memory is I would go to football practice, come home and we would play uh, guitar hero. And then eventually, I, I don't know why, I just had the thought, I'm like, I could probably do this in real life. And then, like, you know, I actually got very good at it <laughs> to the point, like, it's, I always. I or always Guitar think, Hero. No, Guitar. Well, I mean, I was good at Guitar Hero. <laughs> now I'm not that good anymore, but I I got I got good really quickly. And I, I don't say that in a bragging way, but. I I really feel like it it was a it's a gift from God. It took a lot of practice, and one of the things that I always tell people: if you love it, if you love guitar, you'll deal with the calluses. You'll mm. deal with the frustrating learning all of the notes on the different frets because there's like five ways to play each note, you know. Um, but but yeah, so I I say that to say I really loved it and. And I really believe that there is gifting from God. And I learned it really quickly by 11th grade. I think I was two years in, I was playing in church and I wasn't, obviously I wasn't like, you know, super amazing, but I was good enough to like, you know, carry a song. And, um, and then, yeah, by 12th grade, I, I auditioned for you arts and I didn't get in and I was crushed. <laughs> and that's kind of like where, that's where it was like, all right, I'm going to take this seriously. I'm not going to let, uh, I'm not going to let this rejection take me off track. So nice. that's, that's the, the beginning condensed. Yes. Um, great, great story so far. And we're going to, we're going to dig more into it. Um, before we do, I'm just, uh, for anyone who's watching live, if you have any questions or comments or like random ass silly jokes you want to make, you know, in the chat, go for it. We we will respond to your questions. Um, last time I was on here with Zach, we had a lot of uh, activity in the chat and that was awesome. So, um, yeah, hit us with that. Um, 
here's a random thing. You were talking about finding all the notes on the guitar and how it's a pain, but you know, if you love it, you'll deal with that. And I, I've never been a big reader, but since I've been living here in Hawaii, like I've got 11 reading gigs this month. Like I never, I was, here's the thing. I wasn't good enough to get, re I'm not good enough at reading to get a reading gig in Philly, but not that many guitarists can read here. This is a small island, but I got to deal with this shit now. <laughs> I got a musical theater book here. This shit's crazy. Yeah. Have you ever tried to do something like that? Never. You want to know? <laughs> you want to know something funny? I could admit this now. I learned. I'm. I'm not. I would never call myself a sight reading guitarist. Yeah. I learned how to really read because I was working at a school where the uh, the guy that ran the music school, he was like, "I want you to teach them from this book." And so it was like, you know, stuff like Mary had a little lamb. It's like, well, of yeah. course I could play that by ear. So, and I, I know every good boy does fine and all that. So I'll just find the first note and I'm like, all right. So you just play it like this. Yeah. And it made it seem like I knew how to read, but I was actually learning as I was, as I was teaching. <laughs> yeah. So, so well, back to the journey. Um, so I met you uh right around where your story left off i suppose exactly yep. um at camden county college and uh i i can say i was how old are you uh, i just turned 30 in november cool i'm 32 so um but i what i did is i didn't go to well i started to go to college right after high school at drexel actually for music industry and i just promptly dropped out i was like i don't like this i don't want to do this um just I didn't want to be in an institution. I, I wanted to live on my own and kind of find my own way in the world. So I quit college and I started living on my own or well with friends. But nonetheless, I was just like, I want to learn what it's like to be an adult more so than I want to learn whatever it is they're trying to teach me. Yeah. Um, and so I did that. And uh, and then a few years went by and I started taking some classes at Camden County um, and at in those few years that had gone by was when Beard Fest got started and when, you know, we released the first out of the Beard Space records and I kind of got my life going. Um, and then I was like, all right, let's let's try this school thing again. And so I started taking part time community college classes um, and that's where I met you. So um what I'm wondering is, uh, what were you studying at CCC? Did you take music classes there? Did you continue your formal music education at all? Or, or was it all on your own self-learning from there? Yeah, so I would say I'm like 99.95 self-taught in pretty much like everything that I do. So yeah, I was, uh, but I, I was at Camden County uh, taking music classes but I really relate to pretty much everything that you said. Although I, I stayed at home until I was 90, 97, sorry, 27. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I think the home would be torn down and rebuilt by the time I'm 97. Um, yeah, I was, at, I was at home until I was like 27. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't really out, but I knew after, I think I did like, two semesters two and a half semesters i'm like um, camden county is not for me mm. i had like a 1.6 gpa i just did not care about school and i was i was gigging to the point where i was missing uh important like recitals or or uh you know testing or you, you know like the, the things they have you do uh like playing etudes and stuff, or you know, I, I don't remember what it's called, but I was just missing an important. <laughs> I guess no. I'll show you how much, <laughs> how much I was like really, really there and present. But I was missing those things because I was actually out working, and I just decided, you know what, this is. I I still I still love um like I, I keep in touch with with uh Mike from from Camden County. Uh, I still I still love them. It was a great program, but it just it wasn't for me. Yeah, I, I was I was working and I'm like, you know what? I when I didn't get into UArts, I ended up doing a UArts recital for my friend basically like three months later. His recital was in January and, you know, my freshman semester at Camden County has started in August or whatever. So like I was already there in a matter of months making the same connections 
that I would have made anyway. So it was almost like just taking it as a sign. You know what? Formal education is probably not the thing for me. I remember I took like a few guitar lessons with um, with uh, Ian Raffalak. Oh, I don't I don't know him. I okay. did. I, I actually wound up going to UArts and and graduating from there after Camden County College. Okay. Um, oh, oh, you went to UArts. So I kind of quit school cold turkey, like oh. after a semester of Drexel, and I was just a. I was one of these kids in high school who was just over it. By the yeah. time I was a junior, I was like, "Get me out of here." And so by the time I was in college and I realized I was like, I like the living on my own part. I just don't like being in school, quit college and then got my life started. And then I eased back in gradually, took one yeah. class at CCC and then the next semester two and then the next semester three and then transferred into UArts and did three years there till I graduated. And while I was at UArts, I was actually extremely busy working as well i i had at that time i had students beard fest a church gig and a ton of original gigs without of out of the beard space that was like our busiest period that was probably the busiest time in my life yeah um, so this is what like 2015 16 ish yeah i think it was 2014 and i graduated in 2017 okay okay yeah yeah i i mean Again, I can relate. Like, I, I think it takes those uh, when you're when you're in your 20s, those years that you have to really grind. Those are like, to me, the most valuable years because you learn. All right. I basically took everything, every gig and opportunity that I could. I know that I like to do this. I know I will never, ever do this again. <laughs> and I know one day I want to be doing this. So for right. me, it was all right uh i don't want to be i don't want to play church gigs where i'm there until like 11 p.m you know or i'm there until like 12 a.m and we don't start playing what? yeah like those saturday night oh yeah musical. yeah i i don't like it um i know that <laughs> say it again i said i i i'm with you on that i've done yeah. i have done my fair share like New Year's. You ever do New Year's at oh, church? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Had a few times. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Listen, do, <laughs> do you have kids? No. When you have kids, if you, if you plan on having kids, your bedtime is basically just just kiss a regular bedtime for the first two years, at least two years, because that's where I'm at now. At least yeah. for the first two years, just kiss a goodbye, because yeah. for the last, what, Two or three months, I've been going to bed at like eight o'clock, sometimes <laughs> seven. Well, it's so, a good thing you yeah. went in the producing direction. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which I, I'm really curious to learn more about, and 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 we'll get there. But I think we have a few more detours to take um, first. Oh, what, I had a really good follow up question for you, and it just drifted away. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we can, the thing is though, we can, we can take it from, from the detours because those, I mean, the, that, that period is, it's almost like a huge detour when you're, go ahead. I have it. I, I, I found it in my mind again. Okay. So, um, you're talking about the, your twenties and how important that is, um, to, to grind and to try stuff and, um, and that reminds me of a video of yours that I watched. Well, I really I listened to it while I was riding my bike this morning. And uh, it was the, it was I think maybe your most recent. It was like what I would do if I was restarting my music career in 2024. Right. Mm -hmm. And the funny slash terrifying slash awesome thing about me watching that was that I kind of in a small way am restarting my music career right now and in a small way i'm sort of like reliving my early 20s even though i'm 32 um which like i said it's horrifying and great at the same time um because i moved to hawaii with my girlfriend and i moved to hawaii for my girlfriend like she needed a change she had a, and she had a great opportunity and when and when i'm presented with the opportunity of move to hawaii and we don't have kids yet. Like it, it, it was a, it was a great opportunity. Yeah. Although 
I had to pay a high price for it, which was leaving behind everything I've built um, for throughout my 20s and really my whole life. Um, and it's not that it's completely left behind. Like Beard Fest is still a thing. Out of the Beard Space is still a thing. We're still releasing stuff even now while I'm here. Um, but uh, but most of my income was just just gone. And so now I'm trying to like penetrate this new market here and and I have to redo, I have to I have to go through that process again of putting myself out there and experimenting, saying what what works for me here? Because what work what's gonna work for me here is not the same as what was working for me in the Philly area. Um and I'm still just discovering what that is. And your your video was quite useful to me actually oh, in that cool. regard. Yeah, I I mean I've I've watched like I, I don't want to say all of, but a lot of your content. And I know the whole story, like the, you know, moving to Hawaii and like it was the, I love the video with you uh, getting your first gig. Yeah. But yeah, I had the same thought. I'm like, man, he's, <sighs> you broke it down. You said uh, it was about the size of Philly versus just the size of, of, of Maui and the island. Yeah. And the, the the thing that occurred to me now, I'm like, Yo, if you move away from this area, it's like you're not just moving from Philly. You're basically moving from Philly, Baltimore, and New York, mm -hmm. <laughs> DC. You know there's what I mean? A, yeah, there's a term for it. Have you ever heard it before? What is it? It's the Northeast Megalopolis. Mm, yeah. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like LA and San Diego. It's like you LA and San Diego is like a giant mass of human beings and then the Northeast megalopolis is like the other giant mass of human beings um, in America. Yeah, because there's so many major cities on this. I guess they're they're all within three, four hours of each other. Right. And so, so you can go on tour for like a week and not ever drive very far, um, you know, and hit all these different major cities. Yeah. Yeah. Which you can't do here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah. So okay. So how did how did you get from being a guitarist that does church gigs and other various types of gigs into being a full time producer? So, I and I would say full time producer is is a little bit misleading, but I'll I'll get into that. So in two thousand. 16 i was doing sessions for a group called social club misfits they're a christian rap group and i meet this guy named wes pendleton who started a company called soul surplus with two of my friends uh john and joel mcneil and at the session i'll never forget this he was like yo man like you should be you know doing stuff with us he said you'll make a lot of money um, and you know how it is if if anyone promises you as a musician like yo you're gonna make a lot of money if you do this thing with me immediately it's like all right this is some this is bull yeah <laughs> I, I there's immediate skepticism and so and i didn't know wes all too well at that point at, i mean now wes he's like man is a brother to me you know um but yeah when he when he said it then you know of course I, because he was working with with two of my friends I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'll still, I'll still do it just off the strength of, you know, this is something that, you know, my friends are doing. And so was it, no, that was 2017. Yeah. So in 2000, he told me that July, 2017, then in September, 2017, I released my first pack with soul surplus. So at that point, um, I, I pretty much picked up producing again. I think I was using a Scarlet, a focus, right? Scarlet. But this is like the, the it's not even as nice as the newer scarlets it's like one of those like you know if you you get too loud it's gonna distort mm. so like i have to like record my guitar super quiet <laughs> i keep the volume real low uh, but uh, much like guitar it was something that i really really love and i i think i love producing more than i love guitar uh it's pretty marginal but i i really love the feeling of being able to create multiple elements within a song it just mm. it keeps my attention you know 
rather than just playing one thing. So anyway, I've been pro- I jumped back into producing probably for about a uh, two years, and then I do my first sample pack in September 2017, and then I do another sample pack with nylon guitar, and I think I I could probably say it now because Soul Surplus is you know Soul Surplus is still around, but this is at this point six seven years ago. I think I had made nine hundred dollars off of a, off one of the packs and then six hundred dollars or somewhere around there and at the time for me then i was like okay this is I, I i still wouldn't have considered it a lot of money but it was more money at once than i was used to seeing like i wasn't regularly making like you know six hundred nine hundred dollars you know here and there so right like, you're oh. picking up in small chunks lesson gig yeah yeah. exactly 100 here maybe if i get lucky you know 250 300 you know and um yeah so so i'm like all right cool you know this is this is good so i i i did one more pack at the top of 2018 I, or i did one or two more and on this pack i i just decided you know why not play everything like why not just do the whole keys bass uh guitar and so by April 2018, I think I had done three or four packs. Then I just were like, you know what? Let's just make this a, a I was get a stipend every month. I don't know if stipend is the right word. Uh, I guess it was more of like a, a salary. And um, then I was making sample packs at that point. And um, so Soul Surplus, like I was talking about before, Soul Surplus is a uh, is a brand that's really based around creating 70s soul samples which is stuff that gets sampled a lot and like a lot of hip hop. Um, I mean, I, you, I wouldn't even know where to begin to say like, you know, what, what kind of hip hop samples 70 soul. I mean, you know, a lot of Wu Tang stuff, Nas, you think about like blueprint by Jay Z song cry, you know, um, H to the Izzo is uh Jackson five. So we're, we're really, our, our niche was 70 soul, like re recreating that, that retro sound and we were really good at it we were like we go, go ahead yeah so i'm i'm pretty ignorant on this topic of sample packs um so when you say you create a sample pack are, are you creating like basically like full band grooves um that like 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 are you creating loops or see I, when i was listening to some of your videos um and you were talking about creating sample packs i was like is he creating like uh sound libraries or so for for someone who's completely ignorant can you just explain what you actually do when you create a sample pack all right so when i started working with soul surplus um soul surplus for for us sample packs had kind of evolved when we started they were 10 one minute compositions so we were basically recreating the the experience of going to a record store buying a record uh you know obviously putting it on putting it on the uh the turntable and you find you know a section of a song and then you can basically take that chop it up and put it in so in, instead of having to pay royalties to let's say you want to sample Freddie Hubbard instead of having to pay royalties and and give up like 25 30 40 however much percent he's going to take from the song we created it completely royalty free so when it started we did compositions because that you know that was the closest thing really and I guess this this is something they would more speak to I, I can't speak on exactly the reason why this is just my assumptions because i i came in probably two years after they had started but to me it was it was recreating that experience of of sampling from a song so there were one minute compositions so was, you would you would download it you would get a you would get a folder it would have uh all the compositions uh labeled with with the key and the tempo and then there would be another folder with all the stems for it and so would you be given a prompt, like make a one minute composition that sounds sort of like this James Brown song, and then you'd go and sort of reverse engineer a James Brown song? Uh, not exactly. So in the beginning, I was kind of doing 
whatever I wanted to do. And well, within, it's not, still within like a vibe, right? It's it was still within the vibe, seventies yeah. funk or whatever. And you're using you're using like MIDI drums or sample drums or real drums. No, so when I when I started, I was using like real instruments like what's behind me and that that was another part of of the soul surplus brand we were all about analog instruments and i i still am like i i i use some vsts from time to time and you know digital stuff I, like does have its place but everything i was doing was analog and so i'm and i'm not a drummer so my sample packs m most of the time had no drums on it uh not until uh pudge tribbit joined soul surplus this was like 2019 Okay. Is that uh, so yeah, no, like, brother? Say it again. That's Ty Tribbett's brother. His cousin. Cousin. All right. Yeah. Uh, right we got, by the way, uh, we have Ian in the chat, who is my church drummer from the church gig I had before. He, he he's got some connection with the Tribbett family, doesn't he? Um, but he Ian also has a question for us. He says, "What's with the hate on Garage Band? Do you have any any comments on that?" I have I don't hate on garage. I started with garage. Not man. not you. Just I think he well, means just in general. general. In general. Oh, okay. I was gonna say no, man. Garage. <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I use Logic. So like Logic and Garage Band, those are like brother and sister. Or uh, now that's disrespect. They're not brother. They're like brother and there you go. You know, or sister and sister. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I think Garage Band is great. Um, the the sample from Rihanna's Umbrella is a garage band drum loop nice. so like, like the, I, I believe that was in every copy of garage band from whenever that came out i think that was like 2008 so yeah i don't know i don't understand the garage band heat i don't yeah. hate garage band i think garage yeah. band is neither do i and just this is just a word for for anyone who who's listening that doesn't know this and who's curious um garage so people know that garage band is sort of like the junior version of logic so so everyone tends to know that and so they think to themselves garage band is going to be lower quality than logic and that's actually not true the the, the audio quality is not affected at all by which software you're using all, all simply logic just has more features that's all and you know if you're professionally mixing stuff you're gonna want those features because garage band is sort of like purposely limited it's sort of like a freemium model of logic they took certain things that you would just want to do like every thing just everyday things you would want to do and they put them behind a paywall and they said you have to buy logic if you want to do that so garage band is just inconvenient and you can't do some of the things you want to do but it's fundamentally it's not lower quality it's the same thing it's it's just limited. Yeah, I would say if if you knew how to get around it, you could really make the same exact song in Logic that you could make in GarageBand. If you know how to work around, like you said, those those uh, things that are behind the paywall. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I talked to Lewis Cole. You know who Lewis Cole is? Yes. The um, he's he's like a he's a drummer. He's a drummer. He's a singer. He's a multi instrumentalist artist producer like multi videos, like very popular videos yeah yeah he's Knower. in a band called knower he okay, he's yes. had a lot of viral videos but beard space opened for knower um a few years ago in philly and i talked to him a little bit and i remember he said he did the whole knower album in garage band that album sounds amazing um all of his solo albums sound amazing i think he since has upgraded and now that he's as well known as he is he probably has a lot of people helping him with things like mixing but um yeah point being garage band is fine um just a little inconvenient and my um my friend sean in the chat he says thoughts on reaper do you have any thoughts on reaper i don't i don't use reaper yeah um yeah i think uh i think uh specter sound uh, he's a youtuber specter sound studios glenn glenn fricker i think it's his name i think he uses reaper and his his mixes sound amazing he does like really like heavy like heavy metal mixes and stuff like that so i mean yeah. again like you said reaper sounds like logic which sounds like ableton which sounds like pro tools 
in terms of sound quality. But yeah, it's more a difference of interface and features. And, you know, I know Ableton people think of as like its own instrument, like the type of work that Ableton's interface inspires people to do is different. Um, and that's cool. But the sound quality is the same. Right, right. Now, if we're talking using analog tape versus using logic, then it's a different, different conversation. Do you mess with that at all? Um, I've never, I've never recorded to, to tape, like done a full session or like production, but I did a sample pack that came out last year, late last year. And we, we did the sessions at Mission Sound in Brooklyn. I don't know if you've ever been to that studio. It's an amazing room. They have a big, like huge Neve console. The, the uh, control room has like all these, it has a Moog one. It has um, like a mini Moog Model D. They have, it's a beautiful studio. We did the session there, sounded amazing. It was a, um, it was a uh, Lover's Rock sample pack. And so I'm like, you know what? We need to take this and run it through analog tape. So I went to Milk Boy and, uh, and Justin, who, who just moved to LA, Justin uh, Miller, uh, he, he helped me run everything through their Studer. It was an A820. It was a 24 track machine. And when I tell you, like, have you, have you used tape before? Yes. Um, but a limited amount. Okay. But still, I mean, it's enough to know, like, Oh yeah. There's there. It's just, it's, it's different. It's so different. It's better than, than like I, I had never done a session with tape before that. And I would hear all these things. And like, of course, if you listen to music, you've heard stuff that's done on tape and it sounds to me, it sounds better, but then actually using it and hearing like, all right, I can, I can take a kick drum and push it 12 DB in the red. And it sounds better yeah. than what it did before. Right. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of the tape sound. I use a lot of tape plugin emulator, em tape emulator plugins all the time because I'm addicted to that warmth um, and fuzziness. And it, it, yeah, it, it kind of, you know, it acts as a compressor if you use it a certain way. It kind of just glues everything together. I, I, I'm not like a super great mixer but i do mix and um you know like i used to put reverb on the master bus to help glue things together and i find i can do that same thing with a tape emulator like that, that and i tend to prefer that just to give everything a cohesive something yeah yeah just a vibe um but yeah i recorded on tape at the studio house run by paul green who is the founder of school of rock Okay. Um, he bought this mansion and he equipped it with an amazing tape uh, machine, vintage uh, equipment. And he brought in some amazing guest stars. We had this guy, Mike Keneally there, who is like a prog rock legend, played with Frank Zappa, plays currently with Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and Death Clock and all, all these like prog metal kind of stuff and he's just this virtuoso guitar player and piano player and singer songwriter producer like does it all and um he came in we worked with him a few days just made some recordings just for kicks like hung out stayed up late wrote stuff recorded it on tape it sounded incredible yeah. um you can't yeah it's it, it's un it, it's unmatched it's in, in its warmth and it just when you record something and play it back and it just sounds so nice um it, it's just very inspiring it makes you want to keep recording you're like yeah. shit it sounds better coming off that tape than it did when i played it and you know the i think the appeal of it to me if you're coming from the world of being a musician and you've been in a band you know that when you're in a band that's tight and you've rehearsed a song literally thousands of times it's nothing to go in the studio and record that song. Maybe like little tweaks here and there, but like, you know, you're not you're not trying to do do recordings like they did back in the day when like you've got like a whole bunch of overdubs and you're recording an orchestra. Like if you got a tight band, you can make an amazing record on tape. And to me, that's that's been the thing of like that always makes me want to get a tape machine because like I think if you if you have the discipline to to know your parts and to practice your parts well i think you can make 
great records on tape. But I, the thing, the thing that, uh, and I don't want to make this the tape podcast, but <laughs> what I, the thing I love most about tape is how it translates to to all all genres really well. Like I remember reading an article from this had to be like 2000, 2001, but uh, it was Dr. Dre talking about how he still was using tape for when he made uh, the, the Chronic 2001 album, because when he, when he tried using Pro Tools, you know, back in that time when the Pro Tools was like pretty much still a new thing, he said he lost his bass. Like mm. He didn't have that same like big, you know, big bass sound. And like, you know, he was, he was still using tape, even though the technology at that point had advanced. And like, you know, you, you listen to hip hop records that were made on tape. There's, there's just, there's something different to it, even though like, you know, you're not, and not, not to get like super nerdy, but I think that to me, the, the, the most lush sounding music is music that's recorded with a nice, like tube condenser microphone in front of like an acoustic guitar or like in front of an upright bass, just real instruments. Mm. And that has a sound when you record that to tape, it has like, it just takes on a different life. Like, it's, yeah. It's interesting that for you as someone who makes digital sample packs for a living that you're so in love with the tape. Um, and I mean, it's cool. I probably, that probably is a big, I'm guessing is a big part of your sound and your vibe um, when you create. So I, I have another question about the sample packs that you make. Um, Cause I'm still, I'm still uh, honing in on my understanding of what you do when you create a sample pack. So you, I can see that you play keyboards um, <laughs> from your surroundings and I see a bass, I see some various guitars. Are you creating like layers of keys and bass and guitars, but with no drums? It's like a one minute composition with lots of instruments, but no drums or, or yeah. How, how, how does that all work? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the, the best thing to do would be to walk you through my process. So yeah. Uh, essentially, yeah, there's, there's no drums, at least when I, when I first started, cause it, it went from one minute compositions to loops. Okay. And like a lot of the times, a lot of the time I was working by myself and it would be no drums. I would say probably on like 90% of, of the stuff that I've, that I've done. And, um, so the way I would start, I would start with electric bass. So I don't think it's in the shot, but I have a, I have a Fender jazz bass. Uh, with flat wounds so you get that like really really thuddy you know 70s sound vintage sound and for me I, I like to start with the rhythm instruments because to me it just it lays the foundation nicely and because there was no drums the bass is going to be the most dominant uh rhythmic element but then also of course bass is going to have like you know the, the harmonic content and all that so i'll start with bass and then um, I would do guitar next because that's like the most comfortable thing for me and I can get the idea out very well. Um, I would do like maybe two or three guitar parts. Then I would do acoustic guitar if I was feeling it on there or like a nylon string guitar. And then I would fill it in with the uh, the pianette that's on top of the rose behind me. And then um, maybe I'll use like the, uh, the mini log. This was like 2017. So most of this stuff or 2018, a lot of stuff I didn't have yet. It was kind of just like mini log, uh, the pianette on top of the rows, bass, and like one or two guitars. So yeah, just just basically starting with the bass building on top of that. Um, I'll do like an A section with one chord progression, then I'll do a B section that switches it up and then end it and then on to the next one. So very process oriented. Um, and. And I heard you uh, from watching one of your videos again. Um, I heard you talking about you. You're very structured. You're like you break your. You've got a schedule for yourself. You break your day up into two chunks, and then each of those two chunks you break up into two chunks, and you're trying to and you're trying to go in and deliver something creative every day, um, right. multiple times a day, really, um, which is awesome. Uh, so that that brings me to this question I like to ask about art versus craft, mm -hmm. right? So how do you think about art versus craft and what you do? Like is what you do when you create um when you create these sample packs, do you think of it as art? Do you think of it as craft? Um 
or is your you is your YouTube channel more your art? Be uh, like, yeah, what? Well, yeah, how do you think about that? That's a very good question. Uh, I guess to to be as concise as I can be, and to give it as definitive of an answer as I can give, it's both. For me, I had to be structured because. I wanted to make money. <laughs> and then when finally, when I didn't have to create as much, which I would say happened around 2020, I had to ask myself, all right, now let's, now that the, the, uh, you know, the constraints aren't on me, the, the deadlines aren't crazy like they used to be. Cause I, we were like, we were churning out like once a week, making a whole entire sample pack once a week. Now that that's not on me, how would I create? And I would try and sit there and, and, you know, like really focus, like, okay, let me make something that I like. And then I found that not only was I still fulfilled making music in that uh, formulaic uh, manner, it was still fulfilling for me, but also it was the music that connected most with people because the other, the other part of it is I enjoy doing a lot of different genres. Like I, I put out a single three years ago it's a it's a pop single. It's not really like anything that I've done before. And people don't I mean, people don't really know, like I was in a band. It wasn't really like a rock band, but like we had songs that would like, you know, definitely, you know, I was I was using my uh, my TC Electronic Dark Matter pretty heavy, you know, it was a pretty great. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that pedal. I'm not, but I'm familiar with TC Electronics. I got I got one right here. Are you yeah. Okay. Yep. TC, they 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 got some some really good stuff. The the dark matter is like a. Uh, I would say it's it's gonna get you in that like Marshall. If you're if you come into it with a clean tone, you'll get more of like a Marshall kind of like half stack. That's how I think about it. Um. So yeah, but I I like to do a lot of different things. But I was feeling like man, like you know, people really only know me for for soul and and r and b and like the when my music would get sampled or my you know my packs would get get sampled and end up on records that were on the radio it was most of the time r and b and then hip hop music but i'm like man i you know i really like to make pop music you know i like to do rock music i like to experiment but somewhere along the way i just became happy just creating and not just just being able to just sit down and make something and not have to try and overthink it let me try and put myself in this box or no i want to be out of a box for me i just eventually i don't know i just kind of fell into the thing that i felt like people people gravitated towards the most but then also the thing that i felt like i was best at creating and just naturally happened for me yeah so yeah it seems like from from what you're saying you sort of you sort of earned the ability to to take the stuff you were creating into the direction you wanted um by grinding and putting out a ton of work and then i guess achieving some sort of success to the point where you had a little bit more time freed up and people were like all right you've proven yourself here's a here's enough money to survive on now you can do what you want yeah. Uh, maybe maybe to was i i don't know maybe to a large extent no, you're, you're right no you yeah. i'm also laughing because i said i was going to be concise and i realized i can't <laughs> <laughs> hey this is this is like a podcast so being not concise is good um okay. yeah um so yeah i feel like um what one, one thing that one thing I like to think about is um, the the creative the creative flow, right? Getting into that flow state. Um, I think about like turning on like a faucet, right? Uh, and it's like you you turn on the faucet and and the water flows out, and that's that's like uh, that's your creative flow. And and what happens when people are first getting into being creative, or um, or they've had a break from being creative, the the faucet can get like rusted over. And then it like takes a lot of force to like break up that rust or a lot of grease or something. And, it, and it's really hard to reopen. But when you're going back to it every single day, the way that you do, 
it, it just gets nice and lubricated. And it's like, you know, you just know what to do. You know how to turn that thing on. It turns on easily and, and just comes out. You don't have to agonize over it or anything. It just you just sit down. Yeah, it's 9 a.m. You sit down behind your computer and and it, and it comes out. And it, and it might come out a little different every day, but because, because you're committed to creating so much volume, you don't have to worry so much about, uh, if to, if the thing you're making right now is the best thing you ever made, because if it's not, you're just going to make the best thing you ever made next time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that is literally the exact way that I think about it. And again, not, not to get too like religious, but I, I feel like it's a, it is a, a gift from God. Like be, being creative is is something that I've never truly struggled with. Now it, you're right. It, it, it came from, from volume. It's not like, Oh, you know, I, I can just be creative. I don't have to try. No, it, it, it takes a lot of effort, but, but yeah, it's, it's the volume. And, and sometimes I do get in my head because like I said, sometimes it's like, Oh, well, you know, I want to be the guy that makes the the pop song. I want to be the guy that makes this song. But I've always done best when I'm just like, you know what? Um, you know, my idealism is not serving me right now. So mm. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make what I have to. I'm gonna I'm gonna do what's best for this creation. I'm gonna finish the idea, and I'm gonna move on. Like I remember, I was I was doing a session a few weeks ago with one of my friends, and she's like, "Yeah, well, you know, I I made something. I'm like, I don't really like this." She's like, "Well, yeah, you know, we can come back to it." I'm like, "Nah." <laughs> I don't come back to this, but it's because I know sometimes there there are ideas you just have to get them out. You just have to do them so that you can move on. And yes. you 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 want to. I know for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, I hate this, but I still have to finish it because somewhere along the way, you might you might make the right turn and it becomes something that you love. Right. You know, but you you have to make ideas and take them to the as far as they can go and just doing that over and over again you're right it, it's it, it's it's like staying lubricated and right. and staying in shape you know right you have to develop the habit of finishing things so that yeah. when you when you're making the thing that was super inspired you can finish it because yeah. you're in the habit of finishing things and you know how to do that it's a skill um so we talked about you, you, you like sort of earning the ability to be more creative and a little bit more free with your time, right? So let's talk about the business of that a little bit. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you could talk about how it is now or how it got to be how it is now, but, um, yeah, how, how does the, how does the sample, the sample pack business work, right? Like you, you, you created something by yourself in a room and, then it wound up on the radio and it wound up tour like you know they took the song on tour around the world how does that reflect back on you does does anyone know that it was you do you get paid extra because it got picked up how, yeah how does that all work yeah all right so um i'll tell i'll tell the whole story because i guess it, it does kind of tie into how i how I was able to afford the extra time. So um, I was with Soul Surplus from 2018, officially 2018 to 2020. During that time, it, it, I made a lot of sample packs and they were all royalty free. Meaning like, let's say, you know, famous famous producer or, or a producer that produces for famous artists buys a sample pack and uses something that I created and, um, you know, he produced it's it ends up on a record for say, I don't want to use a real one. There's 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 a lot of them. Let's just say uh, I'll, I'll use Michael Jackson because he's no longer here. Right. Let's say it ends up on a Michael Jackson record um, because it's royalty free. I don't I don't most of the time I'm not a part of that process at all. So right. you just put it on the Internet. You said, here, take it. And they were like, all right, I'll take it. Because I'm getting paid every month from from Soul Surplus. You're just on salary. I want salary. Right. So I have so many sample packs out there that are royalty free. And I made a playlist and the playlist is not even all of the songs that are out there that that sample my work. But there's like 30 to 40 songs of artists that we that we all know. 
like very well-known artists, like legend, legendary artists. And I have, I would say maybe there's like two, two or three songs that the producer decided to reach out and like, you know, either give me credit or give me publishing, you know what I mean? And the thing is they're, they're not entitled to do that. Um, but more often than not, it's just, it, there's so much stuff out there about like legendary artists that m people will never know it's me unless like, you know, you're familiar with what I do and you know my sound. Like I still to this day, it's, it's 2024. Some of the stuff I made in 2018, and I still have friends that will reach out to me and be like, yo, is this you? I'm like, yep. <laughs> 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 um. So so yeah, from from 2018 to 2020, it was it was you know just that that grind, creating a lot of work. At one point in the summer of 2019, um, the company hit a little rough patch, and like you know my my pay got slashed, and so it's like one of those you know gut check moments. Mm. But um, in 2020, Soul Surplus was acquired by Splice, mm. so it's turned into me now having a full-time position at Splice through the acquisition, which is how I'm, I was able to, um, I guess not, not necessarily afford extra time, but it's more so the, the effort and what my role is and, and what I'm doing on a day to day. So, so surplus at its biggest was six people, the three, the three founders, me, um pudge trivet and um l who did graphic design then i went to a company at the time that was about a startup of 150 people that and Splice is a is a tech company essentially so it's a completely different environment the i'm not gonna say i i guess you could say the the motivation is a little bit different and the the brand is is a lot less niche because I'm going from a company that's that's like okay, this is 70 samples. You see it in the fonts, you see it in the the marketing and the presentation. To where like you know, Splice is is appealing to a lot more people. You know, there's there's shareholders and it's 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 a it's a startup. You know, yeah. So, um, but with that comes the benefit of all right. Now when it's time to make a sample pack. It's not the the cost that it takes to make a sample pack was just my salary, but now like you know at, it wouldn't when I was with Soul Surplus, of course. But like now at Splice, you know, we have like whole budgets where like I could go record strings at at Milk Boy, and I can I can go and run stuff through analog tape, and I can I can travel to California and record at Sound Factory, where they recorded uh you know like what's going on with Marvin Gaye and you know, uh, I want you back and all of that, uh, Jackson five. So there's the, the budget is a lot bigger. I can hire people to, or not, not hire, but really commission people to, to, um, you know, do things that I can't do. So like, you know, I think, uh, one of the coolest projects I did was recently in Dallas where we did a, a mariachi pack. And like there was a, a a harpist there, like there's the guy playing a guitar room. Yeah, it was like something I would never never be able to do. At that point, I had never even heard a mariachi play in person. Yeah. So that's that's Great where video, by the way. That's Thank a, you. Yeah, to for people to check out. Yeah, you documented that. Yeah, and you know it's funny the the stuff like that. I knew that that video wouldn't wouldn't be my my most viewed video, but it's one of those things where it's like there's no way I I can just not tell this story. Yeah, there's a story that has to be told, you know. Totally. And uh, I appreciate it though. Yeah, wow. it was cool. I mean, it's it that's a, the whole story that you just told is an awesome story. It's a great success story. Um, it's rather different than most people I know who are musicians um, in a way that's really cool. I mean, it sounds really desirable um, to have wound up in the position that you're in. Um, 
being that I think you could do a lot of work remotely, but you also have the option of linking up with people too. So it's sort of like the best of both worlds, it seems like. Um, so I'm a little bit limited on time right now. Um, so there's a couple questions I want to get in before we wrap it up. Um, before I do that, um, I'll make my like, my little pitch, you know, so if you could go ahead and like this video, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, that would be awesome. If you could subscribe to John's YouTube channel, that'd be awesome. I have that info already in the description box. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll pitch that again at the end. But here's things we got to touch. We got to touch Grammy nomination um, and how that happened. And, um, and, and we got to touch the YouTube thing. We yeah. got to touch both of those things before yeah. we wrap it. Yeah. So, so tell me about the Grammy nomination. All right. I'll, I'll really be concise this time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the way the Grammy nomination happened is that in the middle of last year, I got a Instagram message from a producer named Q soul. And he told me that summer Walker had uh, recorded to a beat that he had made and, and put on YouTube and the beat had my sample in it. And so he wanted to, he said, you know, if, if, you know, all of it goes through, I want to make sure you get credit and, and publishing and like literally nobody, nobody ever seeks me out. A lot of times it'll be like the producer will tell the label, but he actually like, he sought me out. And so, uh, the record ends up, uh, the, the song ends up going on the album, which was cool. It came out in May and then, What's it called? I, uh, so it's it's Summer Walker. The album is the the song is called Finding Peace by Summer Walker. Okay. And the album is called Clear Two Soft Life EP. All right, cool. I'm gonna check this out. Yeah, and then um, so I find out the the weekend before my birthday, like my birthday is the 13th. The nominations came out on the 10th that it was nominated for a Grammy, and I was in your like, 20s. Yeah, right before last, I turned like week of your 20s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was crazy it was beautiful um so yeah and and i think that the even more beautiful thing about it was that it was it was all someone who decided to be a good person it's right. not and i'm not saying that people that don't credit me or whatever are bad people but like he he went out his way like he told me like you know this and this was his first placement ever like he went right, well, from doing like you know posting beats online and, and selling beats on his on his beat star so like getting a placement with summer walker and his first placement is a grammy nomination and he's like but when i talked to him last year he's like you know this is how i want to do business like i want i want to make sure like everything's on the up and up so yeah it, it's it, it feels too good to be true but it's like it's sinking in you know yes that's yeah. amazing. That, that it's it, it's it is even more amazing because of the fact that it was like out of the goodness of his heart that he reached out because it's like you could have just as well been on a Grammy non nominated song and not gotten credit for it. No, I am. I'm on another song. <laughs> That's <the> <laughs> yeah. No, I am, and I have been. Yeah. So like, but this I know where we probably got what like a minute left now. I mean, we we could go a couple more because I do want to ask you. I do want to learn about your how you got into YouTube and what your philosophy is and what you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so this this leads into the YouTube thing, because yes, there's there has been a a, a lot of I've had a lot of success, and I'm really grateful for the position that I'm in to the point where if someone asked me, how do I do what you did? I would have no idea. Like, how do you join a company? There's no way you join a company that makes sample packs and know that they're going to get acquired by a bigger company. There's just, that's not a, it's not a musician thing. Like maybe if, maybe I will tell somebody, like people ask me, how do I end up working at Splice? Like, how do I work at Splice? How do I make sample packs? I'm like, bro, if you want to work at a music tech company, like learn how to write code, or it's or, like it's like you were floating in the ocean and like a surfboard just was drifting by and you just hopped on it and you happened to figure out how to stand up and the yeah. wave grew and you happened to surf it. 
I, w- I would say the the better the the better analogy I would say is that I was still I was swimming in a direction. Yeah. But a yacht came by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't even know how to swim. All right. So All right. <laughs> <laughs> so so the reason why I started doing YouTube is despite the success and being in such a great position, the reality is that, and again, it's not, it's not um trying to be arrogant, but I feel like I have so much talent and so much to offer. I'm, I'm, I'm on so many records. I've done so much work. Literally there are, there are producers who are well known today that constantly, it's like, I'm a well, they just constantly go to the well and they're using my stuff. And it's like, all right, well, I'm the the only reason why I'm not known. I could sit here and 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 say, "Oh man, like you know, I should get credit and they should be they should be hitting me up." But it's like, nah, you know, I, I haven't I haven't built a brand for myself. I haven't I haven't shown people what what it is that I do. And so, it it all came out of me being like, "All right, you know what? I need to stop feeling sorry for myself," mm. and and you know feeling like oh people should know who i am and actually take the steps and show people what i do and and build a brand around myself and and show them hey this is who i am this is what i've done the tricky thing is i i it's it's against producer code to sample snitch and i would never be like this producer used my use my sample on this record and i'm on this record and i'm on this record um because you're you're not going to make friends that way you're Mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna uh put yourself out of a lot of opportunities. But that was that was the main thing. And, 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 you know, there's there's money to be made in having a personal brand. And that's that's kind of what I'm building towards. It yeah. started with Instagram. And Instagram has something weird in the algorithm, where around May or June, where like stuff just wasn't getting pushed. And like now, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm competing with with uh, people that want to see uh, as mo- I, I love Drewski people want to see Drewski like you know go to Alabama and and like tell Joe you know what I mean people people want to see like comedy on 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 Instagram and it's hard when you're when you're a smaller creator and you're trying to bring value through music education and showing people how to produce music and all of that um so I'm like you know what let me go to YouTube I had a video that just was like you know, to the moon at that point and to the moon for me, I think it was at like 7,000 views, but everything I was doing at that point was like 200 views or not even like 50 views. So, so yeah, that's, that's why I got to YouTube. And then uh, around August, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do some thumbnails. I'm going to really take it seriously. And then that's, that's how I I'm here right now. That's the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I I completely agree with you that I mean, I, I personally feel that as a musician who uh, as a creative musician who makes my own music and who makes my own videos, it's like even even if my my actual income is coming from like gigs and teaching and running festivals it's like it, it feels essential. It feels like a non-negotiable that I have an internet presence that goes beyond just like, here's a show flyer I'm playing on Friday. You know, like that's not engaging. Um, I want people to come to my show, um, but I need to I, I I need to put my best foot forward online. I feel like I feel like if you want to, yeah. I mean, in 2024, if you want to build something sustainable for the long term, I feel like it's just essential to have to have a personal brand on the internet. I mean, it's not for everyone, but for for people like you and I with with the things that we do and the desires that we have, I I feel like it's essential for us. And I do feel like YouTube is for at least for me, YouTube is the place to do it Um, because YouTube will YouTube, YouTube will give your content to the people that actually want to see it. Exactly. Um, yeah. And you can and and it'll push long form content, which for me is a lot more satisfying to make. Um, yeah, I, th- I think it's a musician thing. Yeah. Not not to interrupt. I was just telling my wife this. I'm like, yeah, I like short form content, but like it's almost like making loops mm. versus like ever never making a song or an album. Like if you only do short form, you know, it's there's it's limited. Long form is 
to me where it's at. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to. No, no, it's it's all good. Um, I would love to keep talking, but I actually just have to go. Um, uh, but I just want to, yeah, just recommend that everyone who's watching now or in the future go and check out John's YouTube channel. I have it linked in the description. It's called Smythe Plays, right? And um, yeah, it's linked right there. You can just click on it. So, uh, he's making great content. I I watched a ton of it this just today, and it was awesome. Very motivating. And um, very professional, streamlined. Um, and so awesome, awesome job. Thanks for being here and talking to me. And uh, and I hope that we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Hopefully not in a bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any anything you want to leave people with before you go? Do your best. <laughs> Everything you do, do your best. For sure. All right. Well, this has been Making It in Music, episode three. Episode four is coming a week from today at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. I'll be with Sam Gutman. He is my bandmate for a really long time in Out of the Beard Space. He's a co-founder of our festival Beard Fest. And lately he's been on tour with Lauren Hill all over the place. Um and so I'm looking forward to talking with him. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll follow us both on YouTube. And I will see you next time. Bye. Now I have to actually end the live stream. Bye for real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think the